Good evening. We're going to call this meeting of the City of Montpelier Development Review Board to order. <clears throat> my name is Phil Zalandre. I serve as the chair. The other members to my right are Jack Lindley, Kevin O'Connell, Meredith Crandall, staff, Daniel Richardson, Ryan Kane. Right on time. <laughs> First item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Approval of the agenda as printed. Motion by Jack. Second. Second by Kevin. Any further discussion? I just make one uh, addendum that we remove uh, item number two, which is the roll call, the identica identification of the five members. Since the charter change has passed, we no longer have to um, identify who the five voting members are because we're back up to a seven member board. So was that effective upon signing or July? I thought it was July 1st, but you're, you're saying no, it's I, effective now. I, I believe it was actually May 1st that it was effective. Okay, excellent. Which is, that's why I skipped that item on the agenda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we can just take notice of that and move on without it. So I have a motion in a second for the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by raising their right hands. The agenda has been approved. Um, there are no comments from the chair this evening. So we'll move on to approval or review of the minutes from May 7 and May 21. I note that we don't have a quorum to adopt the May 7 minutes because only Dan and Jack were present. Um, and we have the same difficulty on May 21st. Only Dan and Kevin were present, so we'll have to. I believe I was oh, you got present on the. Oh, I'm sorry. You got, you got uh, Ryan here. Well, you got three. Because that was we're now going to consider that the five. One, two, three. Four. It was the last of the five meeting under the charter change hadn't been adopted, so I think we could. Uh, we just said it was effective May 1st. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It does yeah. say in the, it does stay. Uh, All right, let's adopt the May 21st minutes. I'll make a uh, motion to approve the minutes as uh, they're presented. I'll second. Motion by Kevin, second by Dan. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion qualified to act, please signify by raising your right hands. May 21st meeting uh, minutes have been adopted. May 7th, we'll just have to stay in the bullpen. So Roger and Kate return. <coughs> um, next item on the agenda is an application for sketch plan review for a two lot subdivision at 3 Whittier Street. It's applicant here. pictures from when we bought the house. But since then, we've Thank you. made it nicer. Thank you. Thank you. Plenty. And just for the record, it's Joe and Lucy Ferrata and Don Marsh, uh, French hey, engineer. Uh, um, we get there. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Don. So, could you, could you please identify yourselves for the record. Lucy Ferrada. Joe Ferrada. Thanks. And Don Marsh. Thanks, Don. Um, of Granier Engineering. Correct. <laughs> um, <clears throat> before we get started, I just want to uh, touch base on sketch plan review. Meredith, can you give us a brief synopsis of what sketch plan review consists of under the new ordinance? Because um, for years, we've been dealing with sketch plan review under the former ordinance, and my understanding it's, it's substantively different. Okay. Um, so, for sketch plan review under the new ordinance, um, we need a complete application for consideration, 
and the purpose of sketch plan is just to provide the applicant with an opportunity to consult with and receive feedback from the development review board um, prior to spending time and money preparing detailed plans and um, during the sketch plan review there's really three key things that the development review board needs to do they need to make recommendations to guide the ap applicant in preparing more detailed plans um, if there's any additional application materials needed then they need to be requested at that time and if the development review board believes that additional advisory committees need to review the application um, that have not done so already then they may request that and then after sketch plan the applicants have a year to meet all of those requirements um, to meet the subdivision rules and file a new application for final approval that will be a new permit number not sure if that's what you were looking nope, for, that's, Phil. That's, ex that's exactly it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Well done. Uh, is the second level of review, It's we go from sketch plan to final, there's no more preliminary? Correct. You okay. go from sketch plan to final, um, and in final, that's when you actually make a full decision yes. on what's okay. allowed. All right. So <clears throat> I, I can boil some of that off for you and... and uh, so this is really our our initial review of the application. We don't swear any witnesses in. We don't take official testimony because your application is is still subject to uh, perhaps change in response to our observations and input and things. So it's an informal process, and really, it's um, we've always used the characterization. It's we try to provide you with a weather report. Or how we view the project so that being said the floor is yours okay it's uh, the project is off it's actually we have frontage on two streets Joe and Lucy's house is at 3 Whittier Street just off the main street on the way up the hill the two lots on division proposed the second lot would have frontage on uh, Main Street but access would be we propose from the common drive uh, from Whittier. Uh, both uh, lots ultimately meet the setback requirements. They both have more than 3,000 square feet of uh, usable area that's uh, less than 30% slopes. There's an existing garage that um, is there that would partially be on the lot two. The proposal is that that would be removed. Um, so, sort of a straightforward subdivision. The two issues that I think are of importance that came up in the um, staff review is one, currently there's parking in front of this existing garage. We propose that the parking for both lots would be in the front of the lot along Main Street. There's a sidewalk along Main Street, then there's a little bank down, and then pretty level land. So the parking we would propose to have be in the, the front of those lots. The ordinance, the new ordinance, indicates that new parking for a new project should be behind the um, front line of the, of the dwelling, of the house. Um, we would ask you to consider to waive that because it, it doesn't make any sense to put the house up in the front of the lot because then you'd have a difficulty driving around behind it to be able to park. Sort of the logical, it's, this is an infill, the logical development of it, we believe, would be to, to have the, the parking up front. It's below, it's probably about five feet in elevation below Main Street, so it's not really butting on Main Street, but it, it would be there. The other issue that BBW brought up was we don't have a new house, of course, but is stormwater runoff. And in that case, the, the existing garage that'll be removed is nearly as large as a house that you'd end up having anyway. But in addition, if there were to be issues, um, there is a 
um, stormwater swale on, on uh, Bob Gowan's land that runs nearly to the end of the property and we could divert water um, runoff if there were an issue uh, to that swale that ultimately goes to the city system on, um, on Harrison Ave. So those are the two issues that, it, that seem to come up unless Meredith has others that uh, have addressed. The, we have the slopes shown, the, uh, the dark maroon are those slopes that are over 30%. And we avoid virtually all of that. And it's mostly there's a steep bank on the outsides of the existing garage, basically what's there. It'll be connected municipal water and sewer over to Whittier. I think that's basically, basically a summary. Do you have any questions? So the, the, the three Whittier Street building now is two units? Yes, that's my understanding. Yes. Right, Lucy? Yes. 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 Um. Sorry, I'm not. <clears throat> okay. And um. <clears throat> Excuse me, just one second. Lucy, could you move your water bottle? It's in front of the microphone so that we can get you. Thank you. I guess, um, is there a plan to have the building constructed on lot two also be a multifamily? And ultimately, we would like that. Um, right now, we can build, technically, we can build a single unit and convert it. Ideally, we'd like it to be a two family either right away or eventually so that we have two smaller apartments instead of one larger house. I didn't follow that. Okay. Um, I think the rules say that you can build a single unit on 3,000 square feet and convert it to a two-family. We would like it to be a two-family. That's the ultimate objective. Yes. And it currently is a two-family. No, the yeah. second structure. Well, this, 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 talking about the new building structure. the new building okay on, on, on the two. new lot mm -hmm. right a lot lot too with I'm with you what's, what's the square footage on a two-unit building is it, it it's the same 3,000 because the way the ordinance reads according to the staff report is that um, any single-family dwelling on a can Forming lot served by city water and sewer may be converted to a two-family dwelling irrespective of the district density standard. So it says it could be converted. The issue for lot one is that it's already converted. Well, but lot one's already developed. It's already developed. So, so Don, you read the new ordinance as, um, as tacitly approving this two-step process? It's a little confusing, but yes, that it, that it, the way I understand it is that the 3,000, it's a 3,000 square foot density, but that's for a home, and that the ultimately home can be either a single or a, a duplex. So it's a bit, it's a bit irregular to be frank. I'm um, glad the new ordinance has st stood the test of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost been here. We, here we are. <laughs> five months. <laughs> it's a 162 game season, and here we are on opening day with the new ordinance. And okay, um, well, go ahead. I, I think Meredith has, has summarized it correctly, and it, but it does seem. I think we're trying to be straight that it, the, uh, the goal would be to have a duplex even if you have to, you know, get it originally approved with lots of bedrooms as a single family dwelling and then convert it. It does seem a bit odd. Well, this is, not only is it odd, but I think that's a, have we designed now a back door to everything that we 
improve. You start with a small thing and then you get a big thing. And uh, well, Jack, I would just prefer to approve a two-unit building. And are we allowed to do that rather than have them apply for a single? I mean, let's be honest. Here. We know what we're going to do and what we're getting to. I mean, do they? Let me let me ask you. What's the procedure after somebody got a single home? A month after it's built, they want to convert it to a two. Do they have to come back to us to convert it? And well, this is it wouldn't, excuse me, it wouldn't have been built. Mm -hmm. It would have been permitted. Well, I, all right, it's been permitted. Right. But it's built. Six months later, it's built. Sticks are all up and it's all built. Do they come back again? Well, and this is one of the things that I've been working through with Mike and that it's not clear in the regulations. Well, we and at this point, I think it's going to be... A, a judgment call on your part on how you want to make it work both for the new unit that you're planning to you know approve in part with the subdivision um, but also in allowing the the current duplex to to, to stay on a 3,000 square foot lot wait a minute roughly I believe why are we going um, into these knots, it's, though? It's it's the awkwardness of the new line. Well, no, yeah. but let me let me maybe take a step back. I'm I'm just looking at the the Res 3000 mm -hmm. standards, and it says that I lost my page on this. Um, okay, so it says that it's. What page are you on? Uh, sorry, uh, I'm starting on page 2-22, but I'm going to I'm going to flip in a second. So under under 2109C, the use standards, figure 2-15 lists the uses that are permitted or conditional in the residential 3000 district. And then you if you flip to that table 2-15, which is page 2-31, it says that one or two two dwelling units or three or four dwelling units are permitted in res three so are we talking about strictly a density where it has to be one unit per three thousand yes, feet this is the density okay. question this so this is, is not this is not a strictly use question here this is the density question and so the that's where we get the uh section 30 3002 c Four B that says, regardless of what we say about density, you can double it up as long as you meet the other standards of setbacks. Correct. Um, as long as the rest of the lot is conforming, and it's served by city water and sewer. I think to go back a little bit though, it, it the you're really only a, for lot two for instance, you're just approving a 3,000 square foot lot, period. The issue as to how it gets developed later is subject to a zoning permit. Mm -hmm. And that issue, I think you get a zoning permit for the one or two because you now have a lot of 3,000 square feet. The issue would come down, I think, maybe as to, you've got the similar situation lot one where you have an existing home that was converted to duplex in conformance with the rules, is it okay to have that be a 3,000 square foot lot? You'd seem to me if you go backward, you could say yes to that. And that's what is actually <coughs> called out in the staff comment on page five of the report, is that the, the issue here now is more the allowing the, what in some case, some in some ways is a non-conforming when it comes to the density lot to be created with the subdivision. Lot one, in some ways, is technically non-conforming with density unless you use section 3002C 4B. Right, that's what I understood this to be. The comment was not about the future structure on lot, the proposed lot two, but whether in approving this, we would allow the existing structure on proposed lot one to remain a duplex. And I think from the analysis, and the, it makes that question I'm a little bit more comfortable with 
because, like you said, I, I think this single family, do, it doesn't use the word existing, but I, I view it as if you have an existing single family structure on a 3,000 square foot lot, you can convert it to a duplex. I would be much less comfortable with saying you can get a permit under these regulations for a new single family dwelling and then come back in and try to convert a new structure into. I mean, then you're, this is getting speculative for an application that's not before us, but this is sketch plan, so um, that's kind of the point, I guess. But I think because it's an existing structure already, it, and if you just said, okay, we're gonna allocate one unit of density to it as for purposes of this subdivision, under these regulations, I, I think that that structure could be converted to a duplex which then I think it makes no sense to require that and just to, I wouldn't be opposed to approving the proposed subdivision allowing two lots of, two units of density to the proposed lot one, given that. Without, without having to go through some acrobatics of pretending yeah, that it wasn't it is, a duplex. It is, exactly. Right. I think that, I think I, for, if you're gonna create a new 3,000 square foot lot, and the density, I think the intent of the density requirements for the most part is clear that it is in this district, you need 3,000 square foot I per think unit of density. And if you're going to have new units of density for a new lot, you need to comply with that. And I would just off the cuff feel like it would, would be sort of a subversion of the intent of the regulations to build a new structure on a newly created lot that's 3,000 square feet and then seek to convert it and add another unit of density clearly in excess of what the regulations set out. That said, it isn't clear, and, and I suppose where it's not clear, there's some benefit given to the landowner. Uh, well, I mean, the question being put before us is whether we turn what seems to be drafted as an exemption um, where there's an existing house and somebody wishes to increase the density. Uh, from what is right now a conforming lot, where we would turn it into a non-conforming lot, but use this as the magic wand to waive the density requirements. So it would essentially create two lots that would, would effectively turn this area into the 1.5 res. Mm. Well, it would if you assume that they can then do the same thing on proposed lot two. Right. I think, it, like you said, the purpose of the exemption but seems to be served well by allowing the existing duplex to remain on 3,000 on 3, square feet, where it doesn't seem served to say you can create a new structure. But I think, I mean... I mean, I mean technically, the way the language is, is written, it says... Uh, I'm lost again. Um, <coughs> I mean, it, it says, any single family <coughs> dwelling on a conforming lot... So, I mean, I, it doesn't say, I mean, right now this is a conforming lot and building this would essentially, I mean, first of all, subdividing it, I think is, the, I mean, that's the problem of, of, of this provision is that it's, it's, um, it's a conforming lot now. Cutting it in half is gonna turn it into a non-conforming lot that we're then gonna use this <coughs> subsection B to cure that seems somewhat reasonable. At the same time, I mean, we're creating the subdivision itself, at least somewhere in the, in the time frame, is creating the non <coughs> is creating a, a non-conformity. Um, Correct, but I think, I mean, if this were a, just a single family dwelling on lot one, I think we're all in agreement that they could subdivide it into two lots, create two conforming lots, and then have a single family dwelling on a conforming lot. How, how and could we not no. at that point convert both of those single family dwellings into two family dwellings based on the language? I mean, I, I'm just making a point. No, I, that's certainly one way to read it, but it isn't clear, I don't think. And I think that's what we're trying to kind of discuss is what, what is what it was intended when this was drafted. I think there's a lot of language in the new ordinance that's going to require us to work our way through it and and we're going to set precedent here. I mean yep. 
And at, at some point, the Planning Commission and the, and the Council are going to have to put their heads together and say, hey, we've got some really confusing stuff in here. We've got to clean it up. I mean, there's a number of, of, of areas uh, where, that, where that's going to be necessary. Um, so, you know, we just got to keep in mind what we're doing here now is going to be the first decision mm -hmm. on this 3,000 res type of, uh, of zoning and uh, with, a, with a duplex on, on, the, uh, on one of the two lots. So it seems reasonable to allow, obviously, the, the existing uh, use to continue. I mean, there's no point in going in and doing backflips trying to make this thing fit. Yeah, so <clears throat> I have a sort of a, well. a, a question about or something to put out. So say um, on the existing lot it was a single family. According to the regs, we can turn that single family into two families, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, according to the new regs, that's, that's allowed. You know, so it is in a way conforming according to the new regs, right? Because it has been turned into. Well, I mean, family. the problem is, is that right now, it's perfectly fine as being a two-family. This doesn't even apply because you have six thousand, more than six thousand square feet, on the lot. Right. But what you're doing is you're subdividing, and you're I understand, you, you're, you're turning it into a non-conforming, so it that is a three thousand. Right. You know, but it's. I understand right. part of it is that I'm not saying that what you're proposing to do is unreasonable. Um, but at the same time, what it is is it's I'm a little uncomfortable, at least at first glance, at the way in which we're forcing what seems to be a narrow exemption into a much wider. And I think we have to not just not not just for your application but then that base that effectively means going down the line any 3,000 square foot lot in this can be halved for density purposes and so I think we just have to be careful because you, in some ways you're you're presenting the perfect laboratory experiment and that you have two situations that you're asking us to apply this on one is the existing house where you're having the lot and you're saying well let us keep this density because it only makes sense given this application. So stretching subsection B a little bit. And then you say, well, we'd also like to build this duplex here because it's reasonable. Why would we build a one family unit and then turn around and come back and, and convert? Um, and that's stretching it even further. But at that point, it no longer looks like a narrow exemption. It basically looks like of uh, anyone can go through and say I'd like to create in this in in any of these residential it's not just the 3,000 it could be the 6,000 or it could be any of the larger districts where you would effectively half the density requirements <coughs> by, well, by using the way this. it's written now anyone with a 3,000 square foot lot and a single family home the way it's written now not us but anyone mm -hmm. with a single family home and a 3,000 square foot lot can convert it to a two that's the way I read it maybe that's the well it's intent, right I, to the, increase density the in, I I'm not going to even speculate to a certain extent what people were thinking, but at least it, the way it's written, it seems to be something that allows an existing lot that has a single family that wants to convert to create a, a greater density in a, in a particular area. I think that's different, though, and at least distinguishable initially. And I'm not, this is a sketch plan, so part of this is right. where no, we're, we're sketching out these ideas. Um, that's different than going forward and saying we're going to create a new lot and we're going to apply this to this new lot that doesn't have any pre-existing conditions on it um it's not as if you have a one family lot on three thousand i mean a one family house on three thousand square feet and for tax purposes you want to create a second family unit in there so that you can get rental income or you know use this space more uh, effectively I had a question actually, Meredith, about, um, I don't have the zoning map in front of me, but how close are we to the, the 1500 oh. residential district? Is this? 
You, you're springing that on me when I don't have the map in my okay. head all the time. It's, I, but it's down another couple blocks co closer to Union School, isn't it? Right. Or middle school. It's two I, Main down. Street Middle There's School. Main Street Middle School. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of a long strip is the 3,000 in there. And we're about in the middle of it. Right. And But, I mean, by Loomis, it gets to, is does it become 1,500? All I have is the little one. It might be the next block. Is it J Street? Mine doesn't have any. That's all I have. There you go, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can figure that out. More power to you. You're more familiar with all what, the where all the streets are. What would it are. look like if you attach two it's units to the existing structure? What, what would, would it be in compliance if you attach two um, units to the existing structure and didn't subdivide the lot? I, I don't think it is, but you need to give me a minute. I don't think so. I think if this remained one 6,000 square foot lot, the total density is two units. Yeah. yeah. Be because you don't get the exception anymore. Mm -hmm. it, you, you're still, Which is because a you still need two, so it's one dwelling unit per 3,000 square feet of buildable area. That's the density requirement. The only time you can get that exemption under mm. 3002, what was it? C, sorry, C4, um, is if you have a single family home that you convert to a duplex. So they can't get, a, un, they, they can't avoid the 3,000 square foot per dwelling unit density requirement when it's all one lot. Because you're not converting a single family to a duplex, you'd be converting a duplex to a four unit. I mean, and I think that's a, a perfectly reasonable, I think it, a reasonable way to read this is you, it's the, what's clear is that it's one unit of density per 3,000 square feet of buildable space. There's an exemption for if you have a single family house on a conforming lot, you can convert into duplex. We have, we don't have that. We don't have a single family residence existing or proposed. I mean, and so, you know. So to convert the garages to living units would be a total violation. Correct. I, I, I think in some respects, huh? the subdivision creates a non-conformity. I mean, this is the merge. It's not a subdivision. You're just converting. No, no, I know. Yeah. No, it would be, yeah. They, only, the, can, they have maxed it. out as far as it's density like, as it is. actually right at the corner of the R3000 and the R6000. Okay. Your Thank neighbor you. across the street is R6000. Hmm. Uh, On the other side of Whittier? On the other side, yeah, heading heading up Main Street. Um, East. Yes. Crazy. So. <clears throat> I mean, what authority do we have to, uh, if we were inclined to say, given the this exception and given the fact that we think that the existing circumstances fall in line with the purpose behind the exception if we wanted to to grant this subdivision what would that entail would we waive the density would we say we're essentially gonna i mean i don't, I don't know what what are our options there um i i don't think you're necessarily waiving the density you're making use of the exception under 3002C. I think the I don't think it's a I don't think it's a waiver per se. It's a it's an exception in the rules. But now what that does for honestly what that does for lot 2? Right. Yeah, it is, seems like if that's the reasoning behind allowing the duplex on lot 1 then would be hard pressed to say you can't also have a duplex yeah. on proposed lot two. It, right. If and it fits, if it fits the facts for lot one. Right. It doesn't fit the facts for lot two. I mean, you can't use the same exception to get the same result because you have an existing two-family. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then you have a newly created lot for which an application for a single-family. Which, well, we haven't gotten, all right. we've gotten the application for is yeah. the subdivision. 
Correct. And it's, it's, this is, this is the, the conundrum I had in trying to write this as to what the options are. It's, it's an issue with the drafting, but I think we I could can't put off the conundrum on of lot two to another day. Right. Because all we're doing now is creating a new lot. We're not putting a subdivision in there or a single family or anything, or a dog house or whatever, what have you. It, it, but I mean, we'll, we'll have, at some point we're going to have to deal with that, but it's not today. It's not with this application. <clears throat> Would we have? The other, if, sorry. I was, I was trying to pose the question. If the subdivision were reviewed and approved, what permit would the applicant need to develop lot two? Um, they would need a whole new zoning permit application. Um, yeah. But that wouldn't they, come they, before us, right? That's, would the DRB have jurisdiction over a zoning permit application? Um, if it's a, oh, a good, point. Of, right? good point. Good point. The only thing uh, that's no, a, not if it's a not if it's a single family. The only thing that would be of right would be a single family. And I don't know what is it clear what the process is for this the exception. three thousand and two C four B exception. Does that come to the DRB? Is it a conditional use or just says? These are just part of the general standards. Yes. I mean, yeah. I, would, I would think it would be the zoning administrator's call. Good point. Just strange. Oh, great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, usually, like an exception like this, you it would go. It would be like Close. upon findings that it meets the conditional use standards or something, where the DRB can exercise its discretion to allow an exception from the density standards. For it just to say, you may do it. It's it, it, it's to the extent we're saying the exception undermines the whole purpose of the rule. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's that's how it's written to undermine the whole purpose of the rule. The Except, I mean, this is kind of, this goes back to my initial point about even the subdivision itself. I mean, right now, this lot conforms with, it's closer in conformance with its neighbor in the R6000, um, because it's it's a 6,000 square foot lot, and it's got two units on there. So, if they subdivided, um, and each... I mean, now we're we're shoehorning using this to shoehorn that two units into one three thousand square foot lot when it wasn't a single family. Um, it was uh, it was a double it was a two family on a conforming lot, and we're creating a non-conformance and then using this as a curative for that. It's a non-conformance, but it's something that is conceivably allowed. In that, in that sense, it's not so clearly contrary to the purposes of the zoning district right. that I don't. I feel like, given the situation, it's not unreasonable to request the subdivision, and it's not unreasonable to approve it, with that caveat. But it it does raise concerns about this becoming the standard, where if you came in, and got a zoning permit as a matter of right, one week. For a single-family dwelling, before even constructing the single-family dwelling, said so we want to convert our our approved single-family dwelling into a duplex, and that goes to the zoning administrator, and there's no discretion to deny it. Then, the next week you get a permit for a duplex, and that is seems like it's inconsistent, yeah, at it's best, with contrary what to the plan is. I mean, if that's the case, then yeah, you would why not just have 1,500 square foot density, you know? So. May I just make one reminder? This is sketch plan. Yeah. Oh. So you have time. Do we, right. You don't have to come to a final we're, conclusion tonight. We, yeah. But I, okay. I think a Go vigorous ahead. discussion Except is helpful for spend. the applicants Agreed. too, so they don't have to spend. Well, in, in, Agreed. And I'm, and I'm hoping the the uh, uh, the council is keeping an eye on on this uh, because you know we are going to be dealing with this for the foreseeable future, and uh, there, there's a lot of awkwardness with this new ordinance. Yes, and I have been working with Mike Miller, the planning director, on where there are issues, and I will definitely bring this conversation to his attention. We knew it was a problem, which is why I highlighted it in the staff report, but I'm not sure we had followed down all of the avenues you're discussing today. 
our lot is actually almost identical to Bob's lot next to us, and he's going to be building a duplex in the same sort of spot that Perfect. we propose. The difference with his lot is he has this bank and then right. this lower yard, but our frontage on Main Street is almost identical. Yeah, it, it's very similar. I mean, the the problem is he has seven thousand square feet he does, on his new lot. He's got lot. that lower. He's got that extra, that extra, extra land. Extra land. Down and and uh, you know, this is your lot seven thousand and seventy two yeah, square feet. Yeah, but just in feet. terms of the way it looks and the frontages, it's ident it's identical to both. So aesthetically, if you were looking at the both properties, probably look very similar in terms of the lots. I mean, this is the problem, is that there was a decision made at the planning commission level to make city this council. a 3,000-square-foot yeah, area. Yeah, the city council made the decision. Well, the city council passed it, but, I mean, you know, the planning commission... Well, they not know the, what they're passing. ...were the brain trust that came up with it, and then the city council approved it. And and so, to a certain extent, I think it's it's just... that That's part of the problem, is that can... You know, if I look at the 1,500 square foot lot, I don't think the the lots are that different than what you're talking about here. It's just that the planning commission said this should be a 3,000 square foot residential district, and they created these little districts. And this is part of the problem: is you don't have to go far, just down to J Street, to see people that are, you know, enabled to build on much smaller. Um, Lots. And anybody right now can convert a single to a two, but you know, I mean, I guess, I guess our feeling was that we would be, we would rather be able to build a single, at least. I mean, if we can't do a two, if we, if that somehow rule does not apply to us, then we'd rather be able to at least build a single. I mean, it makes more sense for us to build a two, but it's not. Not the only way we want to do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because we want to live in it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And. I have an observation about the um, the tentative site plan that has the parking. How many parking spaces are required for two two-unit buildings? It'd be four total, one, one per unit. I'm not certain my aesthetic sense of of what should be in the, uh, my aesthetic sense of where the parking should be is served by having all the vehicles pointing at Main Street. I mean, there's a- There's a bank? Yeah, I, I drive okay. by it every day, multiple times, I, and I have for 35 years. So I'm familiar with the site. Okay. Um, and I, I understand the difficulty of having one building at on one side of, on the, south side of the lot and the difficulty with placing the other building on the north quadrant in the lot. Um, but I, I'm not sure anyone's purposes are served by having all the parking facing Main Street. Um, yeah, is it possible to, to access the, the new proposed lot from Main Street and have the parking be adjacent to the building such that the parking is not closer to the road than the front line of the building? Because I think that's what the, so behind the front line of the building. So it can be next to the proposed, or the new structure. It just can't be between the front of the new structure and the road. Is that something that was considered? No, I mean, I think it could physically be done. The difficulty is there is that five or six foot grade between the sidewalk down to the level part of the, the lot. And so that would make for a steep driveway. And it ends up 
with another curb cut across the sidewalk. So just to end, and it, if you try to do B71 standards, you'd have to come up the sidewalk and then have another 10 or 15 feet you know, off the edge of the road that would be level or at 5%. Mm -hmm. So I think by the time, I mean, we haven't done the calcs, but by the time you're done, you're well into the lot with a steep drive. So I couldn't say right now that it's impossible, but I, I think it would be difficult and what? it would be possible to have the two parking spaces in lot one and have the other two at the end of the driveway that's existing that was another possibility the two parking spaces in lot one and then no where where the, they're proposed yeah yeah and then the other two in the existing driveway at the end. That's another possibility. But they would still be between the proposed new house and Main Street. Yeah. yeah so they wouldn't improve the. The curb the would be facing a different direction. Right. But they wouldn't improve the aesthetics what, consideration. Don, what what would stop pushing the house forward and putting, and snaking the parking spaces? to the back. Well, we were on trying a lot to be too. minimal impact in a way. We were trying to use the existing garage spot. It has a foundation already. It's down into the ground with a foundation, that garage. Right, except it's in the rear setback. Um, it's gonna have to be moved anyway, have to push isn't it? it forward a little, yeah. Um, I don't think it gets pretty steep there at the back of the lot and I think we'd have problems. You could build it. Well, I mean, you tear down the garage and then have the, the rear wall of the garage be the back of the building so you you aren't really working on a steep slope. But unless you put a significant retaining wall in there, I think it would be hard to put parking. You could put parking under the building. You could come in the way we have it and come straight underneath the building, but then <coughs> if you were to the desire was to have two floors of usable, you all of a sudden have a three-story building, which um, has its own set of aesthetic issues of popping up next to Main Street. Or you have a um, two garage that you pull straight into, and the first floor sits behind, and the second floor either sits on top of that first floor or above the garage, you know? Yes, you could, you, you could, um, Well, I don't, I, yeah, I'm... Yes, I mean, you could do something like that where the garage were just back of the setback from the main street. And you're right, you could drive straight into the garage and either have it detached or underneath a second floor, that would work. Yeah. I mean, I think at this point, this we're just raising the fact that I mean, and it's in the staff report that, as proposed, the parking does not comply with the regulations, and so uh, something that you're going to want to think about. The weather seems pretty cloudy and getting any kind of waiver on that, which is what, what we needed to know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can't, and this is for, for the whole thing. I know you said, like, it'd, it'd be helpful to know whether or not we're even comfortable approving the subdivision, but at this point, there's, we can't, make any sort of binding decisions. So even if all of us said today in sketch plan, yeah, we feel pretty comfortable allowing a 3,000 square foot lot with an existing duplex, it, that doesn't preclude us or the board at the final from denying it for that reason. You know, this is a conversation. So um, we can't give you any actual like certainty as to outcomes for the actual future final approval. It's, I, would, I would think that it would increase the likelihood of the outcome, right? Because obviously the next step is spending money, right? Right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I, in just looking at this, I agree with, I think, both DPW and Don, your, that it makes sense to come off of Whittier yep. as opposed to Main Street. For, I think from an access yes. point of view, it does. It, yeah, it, definitely. It, we'd be fighting against the terrain, which doesn't make any against sense. Against the terrain, against the traffic, you know, Whittier is a much better street to turn in and out of. Um, so, I mean, that's a sensible, that's a sensible point. It's just, I think the the reluctance here, and it seems at odds with the, the intent of the bylaws to have 
all the cars lined up along Main Street in front of the house on what's essentially street frontage. Um, but I think there's a number of creative ways to get around that. I, I think I think you have you have seven thousand square feet in the lot. I think injecting um, construction contingencies and the desire to use existing foundation walls to facilitate or minimize the construction expense, maybe placing burdens on a lot that doesn't have the topography and other elements that are conducive to that. Do you follow what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we wouldn't know, but actually when I spoke to the building department about it, we would redo the foundation because we had that same <coughs> want us to use the existing foundation. Is that what you mean? Yes, I, I guess I, I'm not, I didn't understand. We wouldn't use the existing yeah. foundation, just the space. I mean, we would that redo location. The, yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. That's yeah. more comforting. <laughs> yeah. But you're still, I sense you have some concern about pushing the limits a little bit on that. Well, it's just the old foundation is old. So we yes, no, I understand. Yeah. I, I know old. <laughs> I can see only thing of that. I understand your dilemma, but it would be it would be nice if we had a little more consensus of whether the board is and I can see I could make an argument either way, but whether the board is comfortable with the creation of the, the lot one with the pre existing duplex with meeting the, the three thousand square foot density for the district. And that's sort of a seems to be a threshold question. If the board's not comfortable with that, then we know we don't like that decision, but it at least we know, but it, it, we'd like not to go through the extra cost if, if in the back of your mind you're really thinking that this is the wrong way to go. I don't want to talk you out of it, but well, we don't want to spend money for I, I, okay. I understand. Um, this is a not an idea. I'm just speaking as one individual member. Um, this would not be the optimal 3,000 square foot parcel that I would think was conducive to a duplex. And, and I'll tell you why. That's, some of that 3,000 square feet is going to be encumbered by an ingress, a, an easement for ingress and egress to serve lot two. So the 3,000 3, square feet is going to be further compromised I, admittedly, the same cars, the, the, the parking or the vehicles that would access lot, the building on lot one would be traveling over the same area, but that same area could be smaller, could be more compatible. It, the 3,000, some of that square footage could be used for landscaping, for screening and things like that. But because you're going to double the traffic, so to speak, uh, on that uh, to, to access lot two, it, it, it decreases the availability, the three that the, um, the, the practical use of that 3,000 square feet to accommodate a re two residential uses in that area. So, I mean, it's kind of an unnatural fit there. If you had lot two with a different access somewhere else, Lot one would would be more compatible for the duplex use. So um, I, it doesn't mean I'm totally opposed to it, but the way it's configured, having duplex use on lot one, that's then joined with 
what's what you're honest forthrightly want to contemplate as another duplex on lot two and your building constraints on that's the south side I guess um, <clears throat> because the setback I guess and parking issues and things I I'm just I, I don't know whether this is the ideal place where I would want to go out on a limb and say yes I think converting uh, this is an appropriate location for that to occur I mean to just the pattern of development of this lot over many many years it's a, it's obviously a, a fairly old building fairly old development do you know when the building was built 1890 I'm sorry 1890 Okay. Did you watch it go up, Jack? <laughs> uh, I, I, I sort of go back then. <laughs> I, I know that Mike mentioned that it is on his uh, map of buildings from 1885, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's always been a, a nettlesome parcel with a nettlesome building there with, you know, that kind of parking at, uh, garage building on the end. It's kind of a, an anomaly for a lot of the other development up and down Main Street. Um, just my personal view. Just the four car garage is great for storage, but that's about it. Uh, I, I understood. <laughs> no, I uh, If I had a four car garage, I'd probably fill it too. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> I only have one car garage, so just keep the stuff moving out. We're, uh, we're not suggesting you convert it to a mini storage place either. <laughs> Probably is in violation. So. Uh, frankly, I, I'm very much in favor of infill, building, proving the tax base. Your goals are laudable. But until my lawyer friends over here can figure out how we can create a non-conforming and not, not set ourselves up for a whole list of things down the road, um, I, I, have, I have extreme trouble with it. But I think the chairman's comments are spot on. And it's not anything that, that can't be, with some good planning, can't be overcome with regard to parking and that sort of stuff. But I'm really troubled by the language we've been given and Mr. Miller better get on his horse and get us some 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 idea about how that's going to work and if he's the purveyor of the language then maybe he can help us get through it but I'm uh, I don't like to create non-conforming 3,000 foot lots period end of sentence it really is on the margins as far as uh, even with the new language, which we're still trying to uh, get a handle on and, 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 and understand what the intent was. Um, I, I have to say I stand with uh, my fellow board members in, in, in that the concept is, is, as Jack says, laudable, but uh, there are a lot of questions that are raised by this specific site. And this specific project. One one thing I'm, I mean that while we're talking about parking minimums, mm -hmm. I can't require you to have more than the the minimum. If you do, you do. But I think one of the concerns here is that you're baking into this really only the minimums um, for the parking you know because you're you're filling up and this this 7,000 square foot lot is going to be as full as possible um, with not a square to spare and I think that is going to be a little bit different than you know even the Bob Gallons lot that's been subdivided next to it they each have excess land they haven't built, even though they're going to put a duplex on there, they haven't built to the margins in the same way. And that's just a concern. I think part of that concern that I raise is that it can be addressed by good design. 
if it's clear that this is, you know, a thoughtful use of this land. Um, you know, things such as the parking issue. Um, you know, uh, I, I, and I only speak for myself, you know, certainly if the only issue was the application of this very technical rule about subdividing and what it would look like at the end, I think if it was for a good design that made sense, not only for the lot, but the immediate neighborhood, I'd have a lot more comfort with the broader application that's being urged, but um, I think I'm echoing everyone else's sentiment, and I don't mean to be redundant, um, because I think, you know, it, and, and at core, this is something where we, we're really talking about creating this very small slice of 1,500 square foot lot in the middle of a 3,000 square foot zoning district that, that going to look inconsistent it's at least still a 3,000 square foot lot that's I left know. actually 3,500 and we wouldn't build any bigger a house on it than a single family dwelling this single family that was converted into two two bedroom apartments would be about the same size as what we would propose two two bedroom apartments so we wouldn't wouldn't be a 1,500 yeah. square foot right. lot. And, and all we've done here is sort of skew uh, perhaps the conversation by saying potentially we would do two units, right? But just as likely we would do one unit. Uh, it's just financially it make, makes more sense to do two, right? right. But it, uh, it doesn't preclude us from doing one unit. So what if... Uh, right now, that's the that that was the the extent of the discussion or the limit of it. Um, that it was just for one single family home. I mean, you still have the problem with it's that you're having three units of density for, which usually would require nine thousand square feet on a total square footage of seven thousand square feet. Um, and and you, I think you, the language. I think technically you can't take advantage of an exception for single family dwellings if you don't have a single family dwelling. If you already have a duplex, that exception doesn't apply. That said, as I said earlier, and I think I, I sort of echo what Dan's saying, there's other, there's other issues with this which we've raised. It clearly doesn't comply with the plain language of the parking requirements. There's some, you know, issues there. Um, I think that exception, it's, but it would, so, as I said, it's not a single-family dwelling. You can't take, you know, advantage of an exception for single-family dwellings. That said, it doesn't make sense to ignore the existence of the exception as we're reviewing the application that's before us. If, you know, through the course of the regulations, a duplex is allowed a bull on 3,000 square feet in this zoning district, I have less concerns about uh, approving it as a a pre-existing non-conforming lot in the subdivision. But, um, as I say, there's other issues. I, I don't know. That's that's my weather report. As one individual, if this were just up to me, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to say I would approve it, but I'm, I'm not going to say that I wouldn't either. I think, given the circumstances, it's, it's a reasonable ask. Um, but I do think there's other there's other issues that need to be addressed as well in the application, and um, so the decision. I don't think we're going to make it much easier on you uh, on this decision as to whether leave you. With it being too gray, because I don't want to spend thousands of dollars on a. We can't we can't make it clearer but for you. But are we supposed to be able to have an idea of what it would take to get an approved application when we leave this process? I think what you're hearing from the board is that we're. We, like you, are, tr are working with this brand new ordinance. And as we start digging in, getting into the weeds, we're discovering there are little surprises there that we weren't, certainly weren't anticipating. And uh, trying to get an absolutely crystal clear reading from, from us when we're looking at this for the very first time isn't going to happen. I'm sorry, but it just isn't. I did, Don. There's also the issue of stormwater 
I mean, if if your plan envisions sending whatever stormwater you have departing from the site down to Gowan's property, it's really not a it's not a long term solution that the ordinance. Why not project? Well, I guess I'm confused by that. I mean, we already have significant stormwater that goes there because of the garage. The garage will go away. And perhaps we need an easement that would uh, cement that. But I mean, if there's a stormwater collection system that's available that goes to the city system, why wouldn't that be acceptable? I mean, I, I can't see that on a 3,000 square foot lot that you're going to treat stormwater any differently than what happens now. In most cases, it's going to run off and go wherever it goes to the rest of the city, which ends up in the city system eventually. This swale behind it would preclude it from getting into the neighbor's backyard behind us. The applicant shall design the subdivision so that there will be positive drainage away from building sites and a coordinated stormwater drainage pattern for the subdivision that does not concentrate stormwater stormwater drainage from each lot to adjacent lots. Well, the fact is... But I, I understand, we, we, it's... You, you can't, I mean, short of putting in a collection system, you can't meet that without somehow getting it to a, directly to a city drain. I mean, if we go to a swale that exists that goes to city, we have an easement for that, is that, a, doesn't Well, that if you have an work? easement, then it precludes us having any concern about it. Okay. So if we have a, a conveyance system for which we have access, then that would comply. Well, we, I read the words are on the page and it says you're not, you're not going to create a subdivision that sends your stormwater onto adjacent lots. If you have an easement from the adjacent lots, then you have their participation. I mean, this is. A I good would say that's another thing that Mr. Miller's got to work on because that, I can think of all sorts of lots that would make it pretty impossible to think that you're going to have any lot that's downhill of a city street. Short of getting an easement, is going to be very difficult to comply with that. It, that, that may be. I, this lot in particular. I mean, Mr. Gallons was just in here a few weeks ago, getting his subdivision. And I know that back corner he was talking about as a potential access point. because so I think it goes all the way to Whittier Street, right? Is that the... He, he actually has about a uh, four to eight foot strip that goes directly behind Joe and Lucy's house to Whittier. But the, the swale is down below that. It's, it's in behind where the garage is. It's not, it doesn't extend all the way to that behind their house. I mean, there's another point going to, to Ryan's point, um, which is I just want to be very clear about what I'm going to say next, which is that it's not a matter of having to, um, to do that to come forward, but some of these problems might be alleviated or eased if there was some sort of easement on some of Gallon's back land or neighbor's back land that wasn't going to be developed for the purposes of counting for density in your zoning. Getting enough land to <laughs> make a Which is to say, he's got a, and this is completely off the text, and I'm not saying that this is anything we would ever get involved in. It's just simply because it's sketch plan um, that, you know, sometimes what will happen is neighbors will, um, this, this happens in a lot more in lot mergers, but where a portion of a undeveloped lot is attached for purposes of zoning, because the density is all about counting the open space as well as the developed space. Um, and so part of that might become tied up in this, whether it be through a fee simple transfer or boundary redesign or just simply an easement. Um, it's something, it's a little outside of the box. 
can you can you use an easement for density? I don't. I, I've never I wouldn't be comfortable. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't be comfortable yeah. using land over which you have an easement. Yeah, it seems a little odd to me. Well, <laughs> uh, maybe a 99-year lease. <laughs> So now we're, yeah. we, we've had now we're plenty too of far out of the box. Yeah. Remember the Lackey's tourist home, we had that, that sliver between the two. Right. And they had to work out a way to take care of that stormwater that was going to come from the shed mm -hmm. and not affect the White House next door. And they, yep. they, they figured out how to do it and present a plan yep. that we accepted. So, I mean, I, I'd want to take a look at and the stormwater on any any particular well, lot, willing, especially Bob's since it's on to the work side. With yeah. us. He offered to I mean, allow us the easement and maybe it's to maybe it's a, a, a lease or an easement. I, I I'm only throwing it out there. That would be something you'd have to probably call in some some help on, Don. Um, but it's just one idea. I understand. Thank you. Um, so going back to the sort of proposed single family home, um, I think I heard an option that the uh, the parking would be could potentially would be driving into the building. So if that was the case, that would alleviate the parking on the lot itself, right? And yeah, and I there's also just looking at the. Um, In these in these bylaws, you know, under 2109E2, it says the principal entrance for a, house, a dwelling and building in in R3000 shall open onto a street, sidewalk, plaza, or public green space, and shall not open onto a parking lot. Which I think if you have that parking area right in front of the house and the main entrance comes out onto it. It's just something in the design that has to be considered. So if the parking was un in the yeah, house that itself, would cure that. it would open right. up to something that's not parking. Right? Oh, the right. entrance right. of the house? Right. Mm -hmm. The primary entrance of the building under 2109. primary instance if we did a garage in the front on Main Street no no what would, would be facing three would be facing the side of the house at three Whittier I mean that would be an odd place to ha I mean that's if we rotated the house and had a drive-in garage which would meet the aesthetics issue the side of the garage is on Main mm -hmm. the logical place the front door would then be facing uh, their existing right. house so it wouldn't face a sidewalk or a street, mm. or a, or a walkway. I think they have. Yeah, we build a walkway, that way. Yeah, a, s a sidewalk, street, plaza, or public green space shall not open onto a. I think the main. And again, this is another, perhaps standard that's not as clear, but I think the idea is that it shouldn't open onto a parking. Area, which is as the as currently designed. So. But I think building the garage cures that, okay. and then you okay. can be creative as to how it walk, how the walkway works. So what is the? I'm getting a little confused with all the discussion about how we would design the house and parking. It, as to what would the final plan be approving for us? It would be approving a building permit as well, and parking and everything, or is it just the subdivision and the? I'm just a little confused about what we're ultimately getting approval for. This this is just the subdivision. Okay. And but part of that discussion is whether or not the new lot that you're creating is even buildable it can can be built on within the rules. Okay. So And that's why you you if, proposed a parking area right. in the the plan. Okay. So we could see how it might work. You have to propose something that can work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to have a, a, a final building plan for a building, but because the lot has is small, where it's, yeah. it, it's not a lot in the abstract, it's 
very much in its circumstances. We would need to have these these issues. So like right now, uh, to have those resolved, such as the parking space that is out front. And I was just raising the other issue that goes along with having all those parking spaces out out front, creating essentially sort of a parking right. lot type. So I think when Meredith had met with DPW, is that who suggested the option of putting it under the building? Well, both Department of Public Works and Mike uh, Miller both thought that that was a potential solution for parking, was to put it under the building. We hadn't dug down into where the potential house's front entrance would open onto because that would be something to look at more under a zoning permit or building permit. We hadn't quite gotten that far because we were running into other issues. Yeah. But it does. But, but it isn't. Excuse me. No, it's okay. Go ahead, Don. DBW's comments, I mean, they're sort of asking for a site plan in order to get the subdivision. Well, I mean, I think this is a difference than, say, like a subdivision out in the rural district where you're dividing, subdividing 40 acres into two 20-acre lots where, you know, you don't have to have a great imagination to understand there are a wide variety of places to build. Here, it's so small. And given the constraints of the geography and the topography, as well as the existing house, the existing driveway, things you want to do, um, it is sort of pushing you to be a little bit more specific. Um, and that's and that's all. It's a fine line. I think it's a good question because it's a fine line between what what you're being asked to do for subdivision to show that this is a buildable lot and I mean uh, on top of that is the idea that you're not just subdividing this lot and selling it off you're actually going to be be building so it in some ways it, it may make sense for you to think this through because you wouldn't want to create a lot plan that would tie you to a certain type of building or footprint that wouldn't make sense for you since just from a practical point of view which yeah, is we no. can approve we can approve something you know like I said you could snake that driveway back there and and just let the next person to own it deal with it but you seem to want to divide it and and use it yourselves so you should you should make you should be a little bit more thoughtful because you want I mean we had the whole thing designed a year ago <laughs> and then Mike said wait because the rules are going to change and so we waited a year and then we were where we were, and Audra said, maybe this is what you should do instead. So we're sort of following the lead of people we trust, and we're just going with the process and hoping that it works out in a way that gives us more than the four-car storage units. Right. <laughs> but, you know, we would certainly be thoughtful about design. Obviously, we've done a lot of work to the house, and we care about design. Um, I own the Cheshire Cat in town. We have another rental property on Elm Street. You know, we, we, we like being landlords. We believe in development, actually. And um, so, of course, we'd be very thoughtful about how it, how it is, and we want to live in it, so. Right. Good. I think you've answered as many questions as I think you can. Appreciate. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming in. Yeah. Unless you have anything else, we'll I don't just... know. Are we going to get any sort of final thoughts on where we are? I feel very vague. It feels very vague. I, I know you can't give us a. I know you're not making a decision, but is it likely to be? I can't be. As a I can't be less vague than I've been already. So I'll be even <laughs> more direct. Uh, I'm. I'm not impressed by the project. But I'm just one member of the board, and um, you know the next time if if you take this, it, it's it's a tentative plan that Don has not devoted a lot of time, I don't think, or effort to. He gave a rough sketch of what you could possibly do there, based upon the parcel itself, and 
Um, I, unfortunately, sketch plan is just based upon a sketch, which is not a final plan. And so you elicited my response. I, I drive past the property several times every day and I have for 35 years. So I'm not unfamiliar with the site and what it can be and what has happened at other sites up and down Main Street. Um, and I've been doing this for a couple of years as well. So I, I'm not, I'm not wild-eyed when it comes to looking at plans and development and things like that. I, I tend to support development when it's done within uh, the constraints of the zoning ordinance and when I, I, the design and the thought and the appearance and the overall benefit to the community seem to be served. And I, I don't feel like what I've seen tonight accomplishes that. And that's not very vague, is it? No, that was nope. pretty clear. Okay. That sounded like a no to me, so sounded like we'd have to present something very different in order to get an approval. I'm just, I'm just oh, one okay. member. We're a seven-member board, and there's at least three other individuals who aren't here tonight. Well, you know, we want to do something that's allowed. We're not trying to mm -hmm. skip through some, you know, we, we thought this was appropriate and allowed, or we wouldn't have spent any time at all on it, actually, because... Mm -hmm. That's just a waste of our time, too. So, I mean, we really thought it was allowed. We weren't trying to get away with something. I mean, potentially, you now have four garages, which is unusual for, as you said, Main Street, right? So instead of that, you could have a single family there that would address the limitations, right? Um, and I, I get it. It's not the ideal lot. But it probably will be very similar to what Bob does right next door. Uh, I, I wasn't here that evening, so I'm not familiar with his with that plan. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Did I understand that there was a notice that we're not meeting on July 2? Correct. There's just nothing uh, nothing pending, or is it? Um, there isn't going to be enough staff. I will be out oh. of state, and there is no available backup staff oh, for yeah, July 2nd. Oh, yeah, that's July 4th. Uh, that's okay. July 4th. I get it. Um, and that was, I, I would not have scheduled that, but that was scheduled before I was hired. Okay. Understood. And so our next regularly scheduled meeting is uh, Monday, July 16th. Correct. Any other business to come before us? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second by Jack. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your right hands. Thank you. We are adjourned.